Cool. Okay. Rhapsody, welcome to Idea Generation. <laughs> Happy to be here with my friend. <laughs> yes, thank you for, you know, giving us your time and your energy. Of course. So something I like to open with um, is a question that I ask everybody. Um, mm -hmm. How did your parents' professional life inform your career ambitions? My mom and dad, they were both, you know, uh, factory workers. So my dad was a mechanic at DuPont. And <laughs> I didn't learn he was a, like a real mechanic until I was maybe in junior high. He, when I asked what he did, he always said, I make money. So I thought he made actual money. <laughs> 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 but um, my dad was a mechanic at DuPont. And my mom, um, she would paint china on plates at a company called Linux. And I think for me, like watching their professional life, the thing I learned from them is that anything you want in life, you have to work for and work hard for. Um, Cause they were two of the hardest working people I know. Like I, I grew up in a, a middle, lower middle class family, two parent home. And it's like, we didn't have everything or the best everything, but I didn't go without either. So, you know, I was always comfortable, but one thing I always saw them do was work hard. You know, my mom and dad, my dad would work 12 hour shifts, um, regular shifts, graveyard shifts. Um, my mom, she would work, you know, the regular nine to five, but then when she got home from that, um, she was cooking dinner, washing clothes, folding clothes. Like I never ever saw her sit down, ever. Um, so, you know, that was what instilled in me my work ethic. She didn't even let us like sit down. Like we had chores every day, Saturday, we had to clean the house. Like, you know, so they really taught me how to work hard for anything you want. Was there anybody in your family or sort of immediate circle that worked in a creative field? No, nobody in my family or my creative, you know, or my, you know, close knit family worked in a creative field. Um, the, the most, entrepreneurial thing that I had was my grandfather, which was my mom's dad, he owned his own store. Um, so to see, you know, him have ownership of something, you know, that was a good example, as well as uh, my uncle on my dad's side, he, he had a family store too. But, you know, in a creative space, you know, nah. And I think that's one reason why I felt like I got started late. You know, I always knew what I wanted to do I wanted to be creative. I wanted to do music from a young age, but I didn't have any example of that. And not even necessarily that it had to be my immediate family, but you know, when you grow up in a big city, uh, you know, let's say you grow up in Brooklyn and you can go out and see Biggie shooting a video, or you know, you can go to a show. Like I couldn't even go to a local show. Like nobody was performing in Snow Hill. I didn't go to my first concert till I was in middle school and I had to drive an hour to do that. And I didn't go to my first local shows to college. So, you know, those things made me feel like it wasn't possible. I don't even know how to start. Um, and even expressing your dreams, like, I, I would never tell people, my family what I wanted to do in real life. Because I was like, they're not, they were like, what? You know, why you want to rap? You can't rap. Like, who, who taught you how to rap? How you going to make money off rap? Like, I don't, I don't know either. I don't even know how to explain that to you. So... Yeah, it was just something that I always kept tucked inside until I got around the right people that helped to bring it out. When did you start sort of um, expressing yourself through music and mm -hmm. realizing that that was, that you had these feelings and, and these things that you wanted to articulate in that way? I think even before necessarily music, just writing, it started in uh, middle school. like. I grew up in, you know, I would say the, the, the typical home, you know, you have a baby boomer parent, um, you know, they grew up where you do what I say, like, I don't, don't question anything, <laughs> you know, um, and there wasn't necessarily room to communicate your thoughts, your feelings, you know, uh, in a way. So if I, if I wanted to express something to my mom, I would write it in a letter. Or, you know, if I wanted to express myself, I, I got a, what we call a journal, of course, a diary. And, you know, I would write poems. Because, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't grow up in a home where I felt comfortable enough, like, oh, I like this boy, let me talk to you about it. Or I feel this way about this, you know. Um, so I, I held everything inside, but it had to come out, right? Because 
it, you weren't going to buck up at your parents, so you had, but you had to let the energy out some way. So I did it in writing. And the next phase of that was going from poetry to spoken word. So I went to college and I started watching Deaf Poetry Jam, you know, Russell Simmons and Most Deaf. And I was like, yo, this is ill, right? So um, while I was in college, just getting around people that, you know, were break dancers, rappers, and they were like, you know, what you, what you do? And I'm like, well, I'm gonna do the spoken word piece, right? Cause I still wasn't confident enough or even knowing how to ease myself into the rap world. So I started doing spoken words. We would have like rap battles. I would host them shows. I would always be the host, but in a mission, I would go out and do my spoken word piece. Um, and I knew I was good at language and creativity because I took a poetry class in college and my professor pulled me in the class out of class one day and he was like I want you to take the advanced course because there's something special about the way you write um uh but then you know getting comfortable in a musical setting those friends that I was with you know that were performing and you know that had started this club with me and we were hosting rap battles they went to the studio one day and they said, we we're gonna do a mixtape, right? And I would just go hang out and observe, knowing that I wanted to be a part of it. And my best friend at the time, whose name is uh, Charlie Smarts, he sat down beside me and uh, he was like, I know you be writing raps, you know, by yourself. Like, he, he verbatim, he was like, won't you stop being scared and just get in the booth. Like, nobody's gonna judge you, we'll help you. Like, I, re I will never forget that conversation, I was like, Okay, he was like, "Yo, it's, we just having fun." So I was like, "All right, bet we having fun," and I like, you know, I, I remember the black light that we had. It was it was a it was a home studio in somebody's basement, and they had built out the booth. It was wood wasn't even painted yet. It was just real, you know, do it yourself. But um, I wrote and recorded my first two songs, and it was like my world lit up. And there was no turning back. Like I started skipping class. <laughs> I would drive to school and just park and get ready to go into class, but I would start writing in the car. So that started like around the summer two thousand five. Okay. Well, I want to go back. I still have more questions about your family. You're the fourth of five siblings, correct? Yeah. Uh, yes, four or five. Yes. So, just tell me about like. How do you feel like that dynamic um, shaped your experience and your outlook on the world, you know, in those formative moments as a kid? Mm, growing up being four or five siblings, uh, one, I think, one, I was four or five. I was the, the, last, my, the last girl of the family, me and my brother are 13 months apart, but I was also the youngest granddaughter. And um, my sisters and, you know, all of them, they were, my next older sister was four years older than me and the next one was seven years older. So, you know, they're teenagers, they're not trying to hang with the little sis. So, you know, their experience was, you know, hanging out with, you know, the home, the, our girl cousins is really going out, but everybody around my age were boys. Right, so I think one thing was I spent a lot of time by myself because you know I was a little too young to hang with them, but you know I was a tomboy, but my mom would only let me hang out with the boys so much, so you know I spent a lot of time by myself I, I felt like um you know uh or babysitting the younger kids, and I think partly that's where my imagination comes from, watching Barney while I'm babysitting and all these things um and two, I think just, you know, being with myself and my thoughts a lot, uh, that's probably where the love for like reading and writing and being creative came from. You, you kind of have to entertain yourself, you know, um, and sit in your own, your own thoughts, uh, you know. But th those are the things that, I, that come to mind the most. Um, and two, like growing up, you know, with siblings and, you know, being, I mean, you know, I'm not the middle child, I'm not the oldest, I'm not the youngest. So, you know, you learn how to, uh, I guess, I don't want to call it being a team player, but you learn how to, to just fit in everything. You know, like, I never needed to act out for attention, necessarily. Um, but at the same time, like, you know, I don't know, there was just this balance I had of, of being with so many people and, 
you know, everybody's looking, you know, doing their own thing. You just learn how to exist in that, right? Like even in rap, I think that's part of, part of maybe where my humility comes from, where it's like, you know, I don't need to boast out here that I'm the best. Like, it's cool. Like, I know how to share the space. I'm used to sharing the space. I'm one of five, like, you know? So um, I think that shaped my outlook on, outlook on the world. And, you know, just being around, respecting people's differences. You know, when you grow up in a house of, of five kids, and it's, to me, it's even bigger than that because my family is so tight knit. My close cousins are like my brothers and sisters. So, you know, you get to see all the personalities mm -hmm. <laughs> and, you, you know, you learn to how to, you know, appreciate them and how to be around all these different energies. So, you know, when I go out and I meet people and they're just different, I just know how to. When I remember I know I'm bouncing around. I was in the mall one day and it was after I graduated high school and I ran into one of my old classmates and we were talking. and He said, you know what I always appreciated about you? And I was like, what? He was like, you're like a chameleon. He was like, you can put, you, I could sit you with anybody and you'll just blend right in, right? And that's, I was like, oh, I am like that. Like, you know, you put me in high school, I could hang with the jocks, I could hang with the nerds, I could hang with, you know, the ones that people shun because they're different. Like, I just floated and I was just cool with everybody. But I think growing up, you know, that prepared me for that. Like, my, I had cousins that were weird, I had cousins that were, you know, quiet, I had cousins that were loud, like, you know, you had the ones that were real cool, they taught me how to be cool, but, you know, I, I just know how to exist and appreciate just different people, and I think, you know, that that played a part in it. Cool. Um, so I know that you, you know, became interested in music at a fairly young age, mm -hmm. you know, four or five years old, and, and particularly, there's uh, an MC Light video that sort yeah. of was very... Uh, if you know instructional or like a, it was a, a formative moment for you what, what was it about the nature of rap music in particular that was so captivating man um i think one the coolness of it was one thing uh you know to let's say mc light for example you know to be a young girl but to see this woman in New York, and she's got the hat on, cocked to the side, and the baggy pants, and I'm just like, yo, that's fly, you know? And it gave you a space just to, to be and just to create with whatever, that's how I looked at it. The storytelling, the creativity, like, you know, what you can do with words, I just thought it was, it was just all so cool, and it was so different from what I was experiencing in Snow Hill, you know? Um, I look outside of my window growing up and it's a tobacco field, or corn field, depending on what summer it is, and woods and it's super quiet and to turn on the TV and, you know, to see these crews on the block and, you know, how they wear their clothes and the shoes are not tied up. And I'm like, oh, I like how that fits, you know. It was, it was just something that I was so connected to and the individuality and the creativity and it just like, taking something and shaping it to how you want to shape it and making it your own. Like, I thought that was really dope. And maybe that I was even more drawn into it, you know, being one of five. And it's just like, I do want to have my own individuality and stand up. But there was this something that I connected to it in just a whole new level. That, I don't know, it lit my world up. You know, you, you, you mentioned that you started writing in sort of journals and diaries and that kind of thing, mm -hmm. sort of learning to express yourself in, through words and in a, in a linear fashion. Um, at what point did that start to transition into a more lyrical direction or mm -hmm. going from prose into the, 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 the world of poetry <laughs> or, you know? Mm, um, it kind of, I think, I think one, just starting with the diary, allowing yourself to see your thoughts written out. That's the beginning, right? But to all, always have that love for the music, you know, and trying to figure out how, to, how do you even get there. And then, you know, the internet comes, right? And before, you know, I'm like, I don't, I'm not good with tech, never have been good with tech. 
from then to now is just not my thing. But you know, you have the internet and now you're like, okay, I can, I have LimeWire. I can figure out how to download an instrumental, right? And now that I have the instrumental, now I can try to write to my favorite song, but I could tell my story. So I kind of think that's where it started. It's just before I didn't, it was a lack of, okay, I want to make a song, but I don't have the tools. Like I don't have the beat. I don't even know how to record it. Like I remember, uh, you, um, I would, you know, you know, you would get the single CDs and the maxi singles and have the instrumental. I might write to that, like, and I would write more so about things that were going around me. Like we would have parties and they would start shooting. I'm like, boom, let me write about what went on in the hood today, you know, in the in the hill today or whatever. But then I get to college and I'm like, okay. I want to hear my voice. Like, what does this sound like? Am I on beat? So I went to Walmart and it was Walmart, Best Buy, something. And I got a, a tape recorder, uh, a voice recorder. So I would be in the car and I put, you know, I download a CD and burn instrumentals. Knife Wonder Instrumentals was up there before I knew he was. And I put that mug in the car and press play, I'd open my book, I hit the, the voice recorder. So it's, it's like voice memo what they have for the phone, but this is like my do-it-yourself version. And that's that, okay, I, I, I figured out a way that I can record myself without physically knowing how to work a mic or anything like that, or having the money to go pay $25 an hour for studio time. So I, you know, I just think it was going from a place of like, I always wanna do it, I just don't know how to, how to take it from this to that. So to say, how, how jarring was it, <laughs> was the revelation of how <laughs> difficult the physicality of rap is? Um, it wasn't that bad. I don't think because I knew exactly what the bar was. I was just happy to hear myself. Okay. What was jarring was hearing my voice. I was like, that's what I sound like? Oh my God, like why my voice so high, right? Um, but you know, I, you don't know what you don't know, right? I get, you know, I get people send me music all the time and I press play and I'm like, yo, you can't hear yourself? That's not good, right? <laughs> <laughs> I hate to be like that, but you know, I have to think back, like there was a time when I wasn't good either, but you're just happy to like, yo, I wrote something, I'm able to lay it down and play it back and hear myself, this is great, right? So. That wasn't that jarring. It, it got jarring when I met Knife Wonder, right? Okay. And, you know, I played my first two songs, and he's like, you know, I've told this story, of the, you're, the, you're the star. But then he's like, okay, now you have to work on this, 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 right? And you're like, well, damn. He was like, I want you to study this album, this artist, boom, boom, boom. And it felt like a tall mountain because it's like I, you know, he's telling me what to do, but at the same time, it's not really clicking, right? And I'm, you know, I'm not always the most patient person with myself. So just the idea of like, why can't I get this right? That was drawing to me like, yo, cause you know, I was good at drawing. I was good at school. I was good at basketball, everything. I felt like, yo, I, I could be great at this, but rapping did not come easy for me. And you know, there would be people at that time, like, you know, when I met Knife, he was working at Central at the time and he had a studio there. And it would be me and other kids just going up there working, playing music. And I'm seeing like a lot of people with just a natural ability to rap. And I'm like, damn, I gotta work at it. I get what he's saying, but I don't get what he's saying. That was jarring and super hard for me, but you know, Again, my parents taught me how to work hard. Basketball taught me how to work hard. So I just had to figure it out. But you know, when you figure out like the science of what makes a good music, like breath control, inflection, knowing when to let the beat breathe, like being simple and complex, you get all these things. My man, God dang, the science of rap is, People don't understand, I don't think necessarily, if you're not in the culture, how genius this is and how much of a science it is. So that was like, who, buddy? <laughs> but. Yeah, no, I mean, um, so as you're starting to record yourself and 
you know, you're working with the Cooley High team and you're, you're, you make these first two songs, which, mm -hmm. first of all, let's just take a moment to pause and, and note that you made two songs mm -hmm. and that was enough <laughs> to elicit Ninth Wonder, who was, you know, at the top of his game at that moment to yes. pluck you from obscurity and <laughs> at least put you on the, ro the path. It was a, a long path, but two songs. Two songs. Mm -hmm. um, which is totally crazy. But I guess what was the sort of, did you have any internal thoughts? It's one thing to think, I want to express myself. I like music. I like making music. It's another thing to then come to terms with, this is going to mean making art and putting it in front of strangers for their scrutiny and then it's going to mean me physically standing on stages in front of lots and lots of people that are staring at me <laughs> and I have to at least communicate that I'm comfortable with this scenario <laughs> which is entirely unnatural in any other setting and like I guess was were these things that you thought about and articulated in your own head consciously at all? I don't think, I don't think I, not that far in, in advance, like. Sorry, I'm, I'm, that's, that's the, more perhaps speaks to the neuroses that I live with. <laughs> I mean, it came in phases, right? Like, it's one thing to be in the, the act of creating the music, you know, and you have the vision of how you see yourself and where you want to be. I want to be on stages in front of thousands and tens of thousands of people. Like I have, that's a reoccurring dream I have. I wanted that, but then it's different when you actually get there, right? Um, and it's two two things. Like even working in the studio with Knife was like sweaty palms. I'm nervous. Like there's other people in here. They get to see me mess up. Like that's that was nerve-wracking for me it took me a long time to really get comfortable with it and i remember getting really frustrated in those moments like just him giving me direction and it wasn't the fact that he was giving me direction it was just like i wasn't getting it fast as i i thought i should get it and i felt like i looked like a jerk in front of everybody and i'm like yo they probably think i suck and it was a confidence thing then too like you get in front of the stages which now i love performing but I I grew up, every, I was so shy. Like, now you wouldn't think it, I'm just very outgoing, but I was super, super shy growing up, very quiet. So when my family knew and found out I started rapping and they came to my first show, they were like, who is this person? Like my mom, my cousins, they would tell me all the time, like, yo, you got up there and we didn't even know who who are you, right? And I remember like having my first shows or even like being in high school and trying to rap at the pep rally. And the first time I even tried to do that, I went blank after the first bar because I think one, going back to like growing up in a home and never really having space to communicate, being on a microphone and you start speaking or rapping and everybody's quiet because they're listening, that was so foreign to me. I was like, you know, I had a moment of like, one, why y'all quiet? But it's because they're listening. And then hearing myself talk and actually people listen, that, that used to freak me out because I never had that space. So it was super, super uncomfortable for me. So, yeah, like, they'll, if you go back, they'll tell you when I got even comfortable enough. You have to turn into, like, your Sasha Fierce. As I was going to say, yeah. whether it's, I know, like, I always think about Bob Dylan throws up before every show, <laughs> even at... 80 years old, yes. and Beyonce, queen of the universe, yeah. assumes a I'm sort of person. false personality <laughs> yeah. in her own head before getting on stage. Do you, how do you sort of like transcend that anxiety and mm. that d discomfort? For me, I, I had to be over prepared for it. I would always approach it where you have to work at this and practice so hard that even if you wanted to be nervous, it's such a muscle memory, you couldn't even stop if you wanted. And that's how I would approach it. And two, I had, I had to feel the butterflies. 
if I didn't feel the butterflies, that would worry me because I would feel like, oh, you're too confident now. Like being nervous and feeling the butterflies, that let me know like, okay, you still care, right? And in that moment, having the butterflies and being so nervous, that would take me back to like, all right, go over it again and again and again. So there was a point in time for, for maybe like six years where any time before a show, nobody could talk to me and they knew it. I would find the, the corner of the room like like to put the dunce cat on and cap on and go sit in the corner. I would get in the corner and face the wall. It could be two hours before a show. You're like rabbit Nate Mile. Yeah, yes. <laughs> but I would the whole set, it could be a three song set, it could be a thirty minute set, it could be a forty five minute set. From the intro to the last song, I'm rapping all the lyrics over and over and over and over and over again. Like I, w I would be sick of myself. I would do it so much because I'd be like, man, I'm so ready for this show to start because I'm tired of going over these lyrics. But that's what it was for me. I, I can't say I necessarily had a Sasha Fierce or uh, I had a ritual where I have to throw up or something. But me, I would have to, again, go over everything top to bottom so many times that there's no way you can forget it. It's going to be muscle memory. And I can remember, like, there are a lot of shows I don't remember because I wouldn't even necessarily look at people. I would just find a spot and make it look like I'm looking at everybody. But I'm, it's kind of like an out-of-body experience where I don't even see y'all. I'm just so in the whatever dimension or place that I'm in. I'm just going through the motions at this point. And then I'm done and I can breathe and have fun. <laughs> but that, that was my thing where I just had to... I don't know, I just went somewhere else during those times. Rap is, you know, on the one hand, about self-expression and personal revelation. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it is a pugilistic, competitive sport. Mm -hmm. How do you, as a very humble and <laughs> thoughtful person, um, sort of balance those two elements? Um, I think one in the competitive side, anything I'm, I'm good at, I'm, I'm competitive. When it came to basketball, I was a dog. Like, I would come up and hit the floor. I was talking smack. Rap humbled me. Like, this is one thing, like, it don't come as fast and as natural. But at the same time, I still had that competitive spirit and I still wanted to be one of the best and compete with the best. So I would approach it as like steel sharp and steel, you know? I always, you know, whether I'm in a car driving, I'm thinking of like, yo, if, if whoever, and it had to be the, the top 10, if they ever came at me, like how am I coming back? Like I always, com that's how I always had to approach thing. Like you have to compete with the best of the best um, to even get better. So, you know, it was that, but the humility of it not coming easy. So don't bite off more than you could chew because you might get embarrassed. So that's what it was for me. Like, I'm happy that it didn't come easy to me because I, it allowed me to have the humility, but at the same time, I am a natural competitor. So I, I just think I, that is the best of both worlds of who I am. Um, you know, and, and thinking about the era that I came up in, I came up with some dogs, like, Kendrick Lamar, Ab Soul, Nipsey, J. Cole, Freddie Gibbs, Big Crit, like, you know, these are my peers. So it's like, yo, what you gonna do? You know, you wanna be the best? This is your competition right here. How you showing up? And it was like, and two, I grew up with boys. So it, the fact that they were boys didn't scare me. I knew how to rock with boys. I, I played ball with boys. We would get out of the girls' practice, and I would stay in practice with the varsity boys. So I was already conditioned to be like, I don't care what gender you are. That don't mean nothing to me at the same time. But I also looked at it as like, you know, growing up practicing basketball with boys, you know, I would be like a little chihuahua. I can't really beat you, but we're going to go. But they would always push me to be better. It was the same thing in rap. Like, the boys respected me, but they also helped me get better, too. So, you know, it, there was a familiarity in me growing up and playing basketball and transitioning into rap. And I think, you know, 
that helped too. Because I looked at them as the same thing. Like the men showed up in the same way, but I was competitive with them at that same way. Like, you know, all of that kind of shaped me. So in, in that period that you are starting to create and you're making these first songs and, and working with the Cooley High guys and leading up to, of course, this very consequential meeting with, with Ninth Wonder, mm -hmm. it's a period in hip hop where there is a very limited bandwidth in terms of success. It was not mm -hmm. a world where you could have Rock Marciano and Conway and Griselda and Migos and Young Thug and everything is coexisting and everyone's eating and living. Mm -hmm. It was like you either had radio records or, you know, maybe if you were the most lucky, you were Cool Keith or, or MF Doom and you could sort of figure out some yeah. ideas. But there was not a lot. Mm -hmm. So as a person that clearly never had the intention to compete in that sort of like overly commercial, I want to be Bad Boy Records or, you know, whatever the G unit or, you know, whatever that sort of um, hit radio formula was. What were you looking at in terms of your path and like how this was going to be? Like, what was your plan around sustaining yourself? The crazy thing is I, I wanted those things. I wanted the platinum plaques, I wanted the radio hits, right? But I wanted them how I knew them when I grew up. Grew up, you know, watching uh, Lauryn Hill get all those Grammys. You know, seeing, you know, Queen Latifah's success, you know, with UNITY, things like that. Like, that idea of that not existing for me still, you know, I would see like it was a ringtone era and, you know, you know, I saw it, but there was still this belief in me, like, nah, there's still space for this. Somebody has to want this, you know, somebody has to go to this space. Um, and I think I just never let go of that idea that it was possible. So, I, you know, I, I kept going and it was like, two, I was, I was also mentally pe prepared because of Ninth Wonder and Guru, right? They probably understood this, the reality more so than my still dreaming, like, nah, anything is possible. You just gotta keep going. Like, I could sell a million records too one day, right? Um, but uh, they prepare me and like, yo, the path that you wanna take in this day and time, for you to even break ground, it's gonna take you seven to 10 years. I remember he, he telling me that and I was like, shit, I'm gonna be how old? <laughs> you know, like, whew. but it's like, all right, let's go. Um, you know, so they just really mentally prepared me and they were like, you know, it would be conversations too, like those days where I would get a reality check, like, yo, this is hard, I don't know. And what at that time, what I thought success was that you have to have a platinum plaque, that you have to have a hit record, that you have to sell out arenas like to be successful. Like, and you get those days where reality check in and you're like, yo, am I going to be able to do this? Do I still want to do this? Do I want to quit? Like, why is it like this? Right. And it would be that that village where Ninth would be like, you can be successful. You know, you don't have to have all of these things to be successful. You could travel the world. You might not be the most famous, but you can still have success and live comfortable and eat off of what you're doing. Like just having those reminders and even the talk of like, I mean, yeah, you can make these kind of records. You can do what everybody else is doing, but you're going to be chasing that for the rest of your life. And why do you want to go after the same 20 million people that all these other artists are going to? Do your own thing, get 250,000 fans, get you a Nas fan base, you know, even if it's not as big as Nas, but where no matter what you put out, you got these fans forever and they're always gonna feed you. So it was kind of, you know, the reality check of like, what's gonna make you happy at the end of the day? And it was like, all right, you know, I never thought of success in that way. So with somebody changing my perception of what success was, that allowed me to, you know, keep going and understand that there's still a space for me, though it may not be a mainstream fame, fame level success, there's still a space for me to exist, so. How did you sustain yourself during those first, you know, five years? Financially or mentally? Both. 
Let's start with um, financially. Financially, I definitely had to get a job. Like, where, where were you working? Um, I was working at Foot Action. Okay. I worked there. Where I understand they were actually very supportive of. They were super supportive. That was because they liked me. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta make people like you. That's how you get away with things. They give you a little bit more rope. But um, yeah. Uh, again, like just going back to hard work. I would, I, I sacrificed. You know, at a time when I was in college and a lot of people were going to spring break and you're going to parties and all this. I never took a spring break. I never traveled. Uh, I would go to work. I would get off work and go to the studio every single day, every fucking day. There was even a point where um, I got sick and I got diagnosed with Graves disease and I took some time off work, but I did not take time off music and I was staying with my sister at the time. And she, you know, she was like, if you go to the studio, you could go to work. <laughs> <laughs> and she kicked me out and it was just I was just so broke but you know I would do things uh, even between that time I was super sneakerhead. I had a bunch of sneakers and if I needed money I would go pawn my sneakers go sell them I would add a class ring I go pawn that just to get gas money to go to the studio um, and then you know once I signed with Knife you know he would help out his artists too like you know, there was something, I, and I hated to ask for anything. It took me a lot to get to that point. Um, you know, but, and that was really before I really told my parents exactly what I wanted to do. I was just figuring it out. But I, I definitely worked 12-hour shifts, extra shifts, but I still would get off and go make music. Just might sleep an hour, two hours, right back doing the same thing. Um, and I think it was, you know, when my mom really understood, like, where my heart was and she's not going to get a job. Because, you know, you're like, won't you get the job and do music on the side? There's no plan B. This, this is the number one. And I was at home. This is when my sister kicked me out. And I was still, uh, you know, getting through the graces and thing. I moved to Snow Hill for maybe like a year. But I would drive back and forth to Raleigh, which was like an hour and a half. And my mom came in one night. And she said, I see what you want to do. She was like, I believe in you, and I'm going to help you, right? And my parents weren't the richest, but they work hard, and they made great decisions with their money. So this was a time, like, you know, I didn't have anywhere to stay when I went to Raleigh, so I was sleeping in the studio a lot. Like, it was a four or five of us that would sleep in the studio, bean bags busted because, you know, we slept on them so much. They, the, the white balls are falling out. You're pretty much sleeping on a concrete floor, like, Everybody bringing air mattresses in, like we just getting it how we can get it. I'm calling friends, like, yo, can I come to your house and take a shower, like, whatever. Um, and she, she, this was a time I think when housing market was bad. They found like a foreclosed home and they got me a, you know, a nice little home. Um, they got me a, a new car because my old car was running hot, like, you know, breaking down. I'm having to drive five miles, stop at Wendy's, get a cup of water, put it in the radiator, go five more miles, do the same thing. It, it was horrible conditions. <laughs> but, you know, you just, you figure it out. And that's how I woke up every day and I said, how am I gonna figure it out today? And I, I remember having an aha moment. Like I would listen to rap and you would always hear, I make a dollar out of 15 cents and that line never made sense to me. Like, I got, it just never clicked until I had to go through the grit. I was like, oh, this is how you make a dollar out of 15 cents. You take the, the class ring, you got, you put 50 cents in your car to get to the pawn shop, to pawn the ring that you get, what, $40 for? I made a dollar out of 50 cents that I put in the gas tank. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> you know, I'm figuring out, you just, you make a way. There's always a way. And, and that's just how I, I got through, but you know, Figuring it out, getting family support, leaning on friends, like you, you realize it really takes a village. But at the end of the day, you gotta start with yourself, you know. In in the middle of this, you are dealt this incredible curveball of Graves disease, which mm -hmm. is physically debilitating and also, you know, impacts you the physicality of mm -hmm. how you look, which mm -hmm. as you are developing yourself as an artist. And as a brand is, I imagine, very challenging to cope with emotionally, 
mentally. Mm -hmm. How did you wrap your head around that and, and reconcile your own feelings about what was happening to you? The, the hardest thing I think with that was the challenge of the uh, physical appearance. Like I, I grew up in a, in a family, in a community that they showed a lot, we showed a lot of love to each other. We poured in each other like, you know, my aunts would always say, look at your pretty self, you're so beautiful. My cousin used to call, look at your little, your little black Barbie. Like it was, it was always love, right? And then you get in this space and my, my physical changes, right? I go from, before I got diagnosed with Graves' disease, I was hyperactive, so um, I didn't even know what was going on, but I lost mad weight. Like I got down to like 105, 110, and then my eyes, they had bulged so much, they like they was coming out of my head, and I had this big gorder, and I'm just like, yo. It's the first time I'm like, oh, you, I use the word ugly, like, yo, you ugly, bro. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, you know, even getting through that where, you know, I'm, I'm in the middle of music, but now I gotta stop everything and go home and figure out, yo, what is this Graves' disease? How is it gonna affect me? Like, even, how do I even deal with this new face, right? Um, the brain fog that comes with it. Um, and then, you know, you go through the treatments and the treatments take you from hyper to hypo, right? And I'm a super energetic person, but now I'm like trying to figure out how to level out. I don't have the energy anymore. Now I'm gaining weight crazy. My metabolism is so low and it's just like, it takes so much more to lose weight. And I'm just like, yo, I look crazy, right? And then you couple that with the internet, which is not a calm place. And especially to be a woman in hip hop, so you got all these things thrown at you. It, I could say that took a, a real toll on my self-confidence and how I saw myself, right? Um, and I think that's, that's something like, just recently, the last two or three years that I'm really getting over and taking you know, agency and control back over. It's just the physical part, you know, of, of what people say about you. Because we live in a space where it ain't, it's only 10% about the music. People have to see you first before they hear you, right? Um, you know, so it was all those things. And so now you like, I got the weight gain, my eyes are bulging. Um, you still ain't got the money. You can't really dress like you want to. And you're trying to figure out too, like, still who you are and how you want to show up in this space. like. I know I am a tomboy. I know how I like to dress, you know. I like to, but I like to be comfortable. But then we're in a space where we're trying to figure out how to break through. Oh, you should try sundresses. Oh, you should try this. And you're like, damn, I ain't really comfortable. But we're gonna try. We're gonna figure it out. Look crazy, but it was it was just the hard. And there were a lot of days, like a lot of days, I cried. A lot of days, it's just like, damn. But you know. I, I, I just come from a family that they don't let you do that. So I, I might have my moment, but I'm gonna always bounce back on some fuck it. It just is what it is. You're gonna like this music though. You're gonna respect this music though. So if I can't stand on anything but the music, then I'm gonna give you the best that I got. And, and that's what it is, is all right, okay, you can't lean on your looks. You can't lean on this, but you can lean on them bars. And so I poured everything into the music because one thing Knife always told me is people cannot deny good music. It might take you longer, but it's going to cut through. They can't deny good music. So I, I made that my focus. And that's, that's how I got through. Were there moments, you know, you, you meet Ninth in 2005 and the road from there to say like 2012 when you're putting out your first sort of bigger projects. Mm -hmm. Were there moments that your confidence was shaken in, is this the right path for me? Or like, did you think about pivoting or doing something different at any point? Never. I could say, I could say that. I think one thing about me, one growing up in the era I grew up in, like I'm an 80s baby, so I grew up in the 90s and 90s have a huge influence on me and, and one thing, we, I never liked, and what I respected about this 90s, they, ain't, they didn't want about that biting shit, you know? It was all about being an individual. So even if I saw people, you know, being successful at doing this and other people having cookie-cutter versions of it, I never really respected that. 
if it didn't feel authentic to me. I never wanted to be like anybody else. I always wanted to be left of what you're doing. If you're going this way, I'm going that way. I don't want to be nothing like you. Like, that could be the 90s influence. That could be the Aquarius in me. I don't know. But that's one thing that never changed about me is I, I never was wanted to do what anybody else was doing. Like, that was just something I was like, I can't give myself no respect for that. So, nah, like I always wanted to be loved and respected for who I was and the story I wanted to tell and, you know, the music I made. So that part never bothered me. It was all bothered me. It was always the, what am, what am I doing that's not connecting, you know? It was just trying to figure that out, like, yo, what is it? Like, what happened? Why, why is, is this all we can do? Is this all you like? Is this all the industry? Like, why is there no room for balance? That really never made sense to me. I just never could figure it out. I'm like, you telling me everybody want this? Like, y'all not bored with the same narrative? Is this all women can look like in hip hop? Like, you know, so it was always me trying to figure out like, yo, what's wrong with people? <laughs> Like, what, when did we become sheep? Like, that's what it was. Because that's, that's, that's not the culture that I know. No, I mean, mm -hmm. it's interesting you say that because that, that was a period where I, I, I do think within the sort of spectrum of male hip-hop, you started to see things broaden, mm -hmm. but it was still incredibly narrow. I Very. mean, I can remember there was a year that Nikki was nominated for a BET award and she was the only nominee mm -hmm. because it was, she was the only mm -hmm. female rapper that put out an album on a you know, major label level that year. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I can imagine that in that space, it can sort of be a challenge to one's confidence just in, in is, does the marketplace exist for these ideas that I, I wanna make? Right, it was, it was more frustration than anything else. You get frustrated. Like, y'all gotta be kidding me, you know? And it wasn't even all about me. It was just in general. Like, I even knew so many other people, whether it be men that had different styles or women. And it's just like, even if it's not me, like you telling me this person don't have space? Like, you're kidding me now. Cause you know, there was one thing I always went in, like everybody don't have to love me. I don't expect that. You know, they, somebody always told me if everybody love you, something wrong. It does no way, Jesus. Like you know, so I was I was always again humble in that area. But if you're telling me like nobody else, that's frustrating. You know. Tell me about your process of evolution during that as an as an artist. You know, you talked about Ninth challenging you mm -hmm. and pushing you. When, what were the inflection points where you started to feel like, okay, I figured out my tone. I figured out how I want my ad libs to work. I figured out, you know, you're sort of unlocking your own personal style. Like, how did that come into focus? I'm laughing because it came in spurts, right? And when you said knife, knife, challenge you. I, I just remember Murs coming down to record and he would watch me record and he'd look at Knife and he's like, bro, why are you so hard on her? Like, <laughs> you know, it could be an ad lib or whatever. He made me do it 20 times till I got it right. He was like, you're just way too hard on her. And I'd be like, no, nah, it's cool. I gotta, I gotta learn, Murs. But, um, you know, he, Knife, Knife knew I had to be tough to make it. But it, it always came in spurts, and Knife would always say, one day you're gonna get it all at the same time, right? <laughs> Cause it would be like, one day I would come in and I'd get the cadence, he'd be like, yes! And then the very next day he'd be like, rap, <laughs> you know? Or I'd get the inflection and the next day is leaving, or I'd get the tone, it would always come in spurts. It would just be one day where it's like, this clicks today, this clicks today, but it was never consistent. And I would always kind of revert back to, you know, what was comfortable for me, you know. Um, and I think, you know, even part of that came from, you know, again, like feeling like, ah, you gotta be the best, right? But 
part of being about, I had this idea that being the best, you, know, you gotta be so intricate and the cadence gotta be crazy. And it's just like, yo, relax, bro. <laughs> Like relax, you don't you don't have to have this super crazy cadence and these super deep metaphors. Like being ill is a lot broader than what you think, right? Um, but you know, it just it just really came in spurts, and I think it it all kind of began began to click starting with Layla's wisdom. I go back and I, I listen to that album, and I you, of course I hear a lot of places I still need to grow, but I can see like okay from Idea Beautiful to, to Layla's Wisdom, you're getting there, you're finding your voice. Your cadence still can needs, needs some work and, you know, even um, how you how you relay your, your metaphors, like being more clear. So it, it was always a thing of self-evaluation, but I would say I still haven't mastered it all, right? I would say, this period in time is probably the most fluent in everything, like completely. I even go back to listen to Eve and I'm, I'm hearing things and I'm like, Dad, I wish I had did this different. Um, I wish I had experimented more on this. So, you know, but I feel like that's always going to be me. I'm always going to feel like I haven't mastered it all, that I'm always going to be evolving and trying to learn how to do more. You know, I feel like the day that I feel like I've mastered it at all, it's just a breeze, I need to do something else, right? Like, all right, what's the challenge? So, you know, but as I, I tell everybody, you know, Knife and everybody, when they ask about the album, it's like, look, I have no expectations for this. We have goals, but I don't have any expectations. The only thing I ask is that when you play this album, that you hear growth from the last one with every project. If I put out a project and you hear no growth from the last one I put out, then we gotta keep going. That's all I want. What year did you feel like you were really a player in the space, that you were on, on, on the map in, in the way that the people that you looked at in 95, 99, where you were like, oh, this is part of the pantheon of hip hop. Mm -hmm. and now. I'm I'm there. I'm in the conversation. Um, I I can say to Pimp a Butterfly, open the door. I still didn't necessarily feel it all the way, um, but it it opened the door to just being in a space for people to see me. I think for me, the the, the biggest thing was I felt like. I, would ne I was never in a place for people to even hear me, to even be able to form an opinion of what they felt, you know what I'm saying? So Kendrick put me on that album, allowed there, for there to be a light on me, for people to be like, oh, okay, who is this? He, she's on Kendrick's album, to his sophomore album, one of the most anticipated albums to ever come out. Let me stop and, and give her my ear, right? Um, so that, that opened the door because you know, right after that happened, it was like Mass Appeal hit us first about a deal. Then Rock Nation came. Um, then I go see Dr. Dre and he's like, yo, you're my favorite female rapper. And, you know, then we go to the White House and it's just like, okay, right? And, and you know, people are sending you DMs and it, it's just like, oh, okay, people. I didn't know. I didn't know you listened, right? Um, so this, that was this the is beginning. after a decade of <laughs> a decade making music. Yeah, and I sometimes I, I I do this a lot. I sit and I stop, and I'm like, damn. If he didn't give you that opportunity, where would you be now? Would you even still be doing this? Because I don't even know. Were you like? We talked about luck earlier, yeah. and. <laughs> you put in motion a set of events that culminated in a cold call from... Again, yeah, and I, and I go back and I'm like, what got you, like you said, what got you there? And I, ha I always look back at the stepping stones and it's like, one, your work ethic, you were at the studio every single day. Like, there are times, you know, with some other artists, 
I would go and I'm like, why y'all not in the studio? You would think that, like, if Knife is here, I'm staying two or three hours past him. I was in the studio every single day. I slept in the studio. I would bring bags and stay in there a week. Knife installed a shower because we were in there so much, just so we could take baths. Like, he had a shower put in. And when Kendrick first came to the studio, uh, I wanna say it was like 2011, I was there. We didn't even talk about music. We, we joked, told stories, went to cookout and got food. Just being there and beginning the relationship, right? And now, you know, we do rock the bells and, you know, again, they came back to the studio. It don't matter if it was Kendrick, Raekwon, Big Daddy Kane, whoever came to the studio, I was there always. That's how I got features a lot of times because I was just in position. Other people weren't just from being there and building a relationship. Um, and I think just doing that and just being regular, not, not asking for too much, you know, that set me up to be in that position. Uh, and I, he, he was very strategic about having me on that project. I remember Nime telling me, uh, he texted him, he was like, this is exactly how I planned for it to be. I'm like, damn, that's crazy for him to look out that way. But you know, him giving me that platform and the opportunity changed my career because I could be doing advertising for somebody right now, I don't know. I would be dope at it, but. <laughs> Um, but I, I would say recently where I feel like I can really believe it and see it, it's probably been these last two or three years, maybe from 2019 when I dropped Eve even to now. Because even working on this album that I'm working on now, I was telling you earlier, this is the first time where I've taken the lead on my own project before, you know, it was me, Guru, Ninth, and Terrace Martin at the helm. And Knife was doing a lot of legwork, reaching out to people, doing favors, trying to get me featured sometimes. Now I'm out here and it's like, now you got to make the calls. You got to go meet these people. And I'm finding like, yo, people do love and respect you and they will do favors for you. And I'm, I'm humble and grateful for it. But, you know, it was just something I'm, maybe I'm too humble, but I, it was just like, I don't know. Knife would always tell me, like, yo, you really don't understand. I was like, no, I don't. <laughs> I, it's hard for me to see outside of myself. Like, people tell me all, they joke with me about it, but I really, like, I really can't see it, bro. Like, I really still feel like the underdog, like, you know, even just like I did, I did a podcast and I hit the homies, I'm like, yo, I hate to bother you, da da da. They'd be like, rap, relax, whatever you need, we're doing. I'm just like, it can't be this easy. You love me that much? <laughs> so, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful to be able to, to receive it and allow myself to see it now. But you, you pay it forward. And yeah. when I text you <laughs> out of the blue for the first time in three or four years, you hit me back and Absolutely. You know, we're doing this. When, and when you get it, like I got it, you had to fight for it and shit don't come easy for you, you appreciate every single person that was a stepping stone in your career. There's not a person in my career that has done something for me that I have forgotten. Not once. When they call and ask me for something, yes. So even the fact that you supported me at, when you were at Complex, and I remember, I think it was when you were at Def Jam, did I come play Eve? Yeah. Yeah, I remember you being there and you pulling me aside like, yo, like just how supportive you was. I never, I never forgot that. So when you hit me, I was like, whatever you want, I'm gonna do it, you know. Thank and you. That's, that's for forever. Appreciate that. Yeah. Well, no, it, it's funny. You said the, the the Kendrick thing is also interesting. I was just thinking about he that is uh, to me him paying it back for getting he got the look on Take Care right mm. that was similarly taking him yeah. from relative obscurity and putting him on this enormous platform and then that two years or three years later he would then be able to sort of return that favor to the universe by. Mm -hmm. Offering that platform to you is kind of a very sort of dope, and the, altruistic and moment. I even get to pass it forward. Yeah, I was going to say, now it's, yeah. now, now it's your turn to... Yeah, shouts to Nico Brim. <laughs> yes. Um, so t tell me, you know, you get this look onto Pimp a Butterfly, and your, your life changes 
essentially overnight. Mm -hmm. The opportunities that are being, you know, afforded you are wildly different. And mm -hmm. prior to this, you've made an enormous body of work over the decade, you know, that preceded it. But I imagine there is uh, a new, stakes is high. Um, <laughs> there's a new level of sort of scrutiny and expectation, both from the outside, but also probably internally, because you, this is, you know, dun, 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 this is your moment. <laughs> um, like, going into Layla's Wisdom, what were you, how, how did that change your thinking about what you wanted to achieve artistically and your process? Um, in terms of creation? Um, I have to really go back and sit in that moment. Um, under, under Knife's guidance, he, he never let me uh, get too in my head about expectations in that way, right? Even when um, Kendrick hit me to do the do the verse I tell everybody I didn't I didn't hear what he did on the project all he sent me was the instrumental so I could have really gotten in my head about that that was that was a moment like I just want to make the joint right but I have no idea what to even go off of and so I had to tell myself and knife always reminded me is he hit you to do you so just do you don't overthink it and so when I'm going into Layla's Wisdom, you approach it the same way. Just do you, don't overthink it. But there's still in every project I wanna grow, so how can I grow from the last project? And that's just how we kinda approached it. If anything, um, artistically, I think I wanted to, to do a little bit more. Um, and you know, we used to have creative conversations where, you know, Everybody might not get that or, you know, and you, you learn sometimes the balance of trusting yourself and sometimes trusting others and, you know, just seeing how it goes. So, you know, that was just the process where, you know, I was with my village and we just said we trust what we're making. You know, I didn't, I didn't put much stock into anything other than that where I was still in the headspace of, you know, make good music, people going to love it. Make good music, people gonna love it. And uh, even if it's not, you know, easily digestible, it's, it's good music, right? I'm still like just learning the industry and, you know, how people's mind works. Like I'm just still going through that process, but I, I still wasn't aware of the space as as aware as I am now. Um, and you know, I'm okay with that. Um. So whether we're talking about Layla's Wisdom or Eve, both, both projects are fairly high concept mm -hmm. in their sort of scope. Um, when you are recording something like that, what is the process from sitting down to write song number one, mm -hmm. whether or not that song ever makes the record, to this high concept coming into focus and and then how does that change the process? Every, every album has been different. Uh, with Layla's Wisdom, I was just getting in the studio and just making songs, right? With no real clear cut direction or anything. Um, it was just like, what do I wanna talk about? How do I feel? And then, you know, Nine comes in and we go through songs and it's like these collections of songs sound good together. And then it was like, what's the concept and what's the title? I did those last. I'm like, yo, how am I gonna make this make sense, right? And, and wait, when, when you say you, you're just making songs, like mm -hmm. how many songs are you making and what, what is mm -hmm. the pace of output and how are these all coming together? Yeah. Layla's Wisdom, I worked on that one about a year and a half, two years. I think I recorded maybe 80, 90 songs for that. Um, 
idea. It was, I'm trying to think, I don't even remember necessarily what the first song was, but you know, I would come in the studio like, like the song Ride. That was a conversation I had about uh, my cousin. He called me one day. Um, so a lot of them came from life. Um, what's another one? Uh, Layla's Wisdom, the title track with Knots. Uh, that was a lot of personal reflection, you know, and just thoughts, frustrations. Um, Jesus coming. That was reflecting on the world from a worldly view, like, you know, t my brother, uh, he was in the military and, you know, looking at CNN at the time when I used to watch the news and just what was going on. So, you know, it was it was just everyday life, like whatever I was going on through that that day or whatever was on my mind. That's I just made a song about it. And, you know, knife is such a master at sequencing, you know, I'm, I'm still really learning the art of what that is. So. You know, I, I would come in with these are my favorites, and you know, he would have his favorite. But everything I recorded, I, don't, I always send to him for his ear. You know, be in the studio, and you know, we just this sounds good first. You know, we just put it, and it's like, okay, I like it, you like it, all right, bam. Then it's like, well, what's the title? You know, and it was really a a group effort. Like Knife would send me title ideas, I would have my own, but you know. To me, I felt like that album at that time was just about, you know, uh, about wisdom and giving people their flowers, right? And I was like, yeah, that's what my grandmother always told me. We're just naming after her and boom, we'll figure out how to make it connect or whatever. Versus Eve, you know, I, I came in and I did an interview that inspired me about the lineage you know, from Nina Simone to Roberta Flack to myself in North Carolina. North Carolina yeah, that's how it started. And I go home and I'm just got a beat and I'm, how does the beat make me feel? And I've always had this concept for about four or five years that I want to do a song about being a tomboy, right? And just, you know, it was even self-reflection of how people looked at me, the way I dress, she's a tomboy, we probably, we, we think we know your sexual orientation, like all these judgments based on just me being a tomboy, right? And it was just like, man, Aaliyah used to be, a, she was a tomboy, but she was still sexy, right? Sexy came, so I've always had this concept and I just got the beat and I just, I wrote it and I'm like, and I, this is the time I was recording myself. Like Layla, I did in the studio, Knife or the engineer record me. Eve, I recorded all myself in my home. Um, so I'm going to save the song and I'm, you You're know, engineering yourself. I'm engineering myself for the first time. That whole album, for the most part, I did in my house. Um, and so I go to save the song and it's like, save as, I'm just like, I'm just save it as Aaliyah. And it was like, light bulb. I'm like, oh, what if I do a whole conceptual album? So that one came at the beginning and now I'm, now I'm super focused. Whereas Layla, I'm just, whatever feels right that day I'm doing, but this time I'm, I'm, oh, okay, I like Felicia, I like Queen Latifah, I like Lauren, I like uh, Maxine Waters, I like, so I'm writing a list of women down, I'm like, okay, what do they represent for me in my life? So now that album is done completely different, right? And now I'm on this album I'm working on now, and it's a whole new, new space, it's, okay, this is a vulnerable space where you're letting people in, so it's not about anybody else, but it's it's you really sitting and reflecting the time that you're in, and you're doing this during a pandemic where you have to sit by yourself, and everything that you've hid and suppressed and you got to ignore because you were moving around and touring and doing interviews, now you got to sit with it, and it's like, damn, right? And so you're writing from that place. So everyone is different. This, this one I'm working on now, I'm 300 songs in. And I started in March of 2020. So yeah, about well, two, three it, years, so yeah. It, it's interesting to me that you would say that this is sort of a more revealed record. Because I, mm -hmm. I think of your music as, of course, very lyrical mm -hmm. and, and wrought in that way, but 
I would not say that you are ever rhyming for the sake of riddling, right? It's mm. there are people yeah. who are tex technically dexterous for the mm -hmm. point of being technically dexterous, and then you have perhaps like Tupac on the f mm -hmm. far other side, where it's everything from the inside just pouring out, pouring out, and t to me, you're like kind of like. A little closer to Pac, and not, and not to say that there aren't lots of layers and mm -hmm. subtleties and mm -hmm. triple entendres going on, which there are, but I've never felt that your music was not revealed. So I guess my question is, what what does that mean? Like, what what is the layer that we have not been privy to as listeners? Okay, let me pre preface that with... Uh... I was having a conversation with two friends and they said the same thing without knowing what each other uh, said and it was basically like people have to know you're not perfect one um, that was what one friend said which I never looked at myself like that but I then I had to think back like I'm so guarded in a way like I give a little bit of myself but I usually hide it in a simile a metaphor or I might tell in a story format and necessarily not always shine a light on me so it was like Oh, okay. Um, I'm very politically correct in that way, and just instead of just being raw with it. And another friend is like, you know, we want to know what makes you mad, what makes you happy. Like, do you have sex? Da 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 da. Right. Um, and I went went to see No ID. You know, at some point while I was making this album, I was just playing him records, and you know, he was uh, being a mirror to me, and he was like, I mean. We know you can rap, but what's after that? He's like, I don't, I don't know who you are, right? Um, he was like, let's take Eminem, for example. We know Eminem hates his mother. We know he has a daughter, Haley. We know this, we know that. If I ask you, give me five things about myself that you might know. Fair. It's, you see, and that's the layer. Like, I under, definitely understand, like, I have a brand, of course, but really knowing who I am, so it's me diving in, like, yeah, I'm gonna just lay it out. This is who I am. These are, the, these are the things that make me mad. This is what love looks like to me. This is insecurities that I have, like, just allowing myself to be naked and free and be human, you know, um, and just being brave in that and not, because, you know, that was something, one, I'm, I'm just a private person anyway, but two, it's like going through the path I've gone through, especially like when we go back to how people even reacted to my physical appearance and how harsh the internet could be like that. I'm like, I ain't telling y'all nothing, right? Y'all mean. <laughs> but now it's just like, I'm just so okay and free because I've healed all that other things or it, things that I have and I'm in the process of healing. So I'm okay just allowing myself to be, you know, and understanding like any judgment that comes from from that is really not about me at the end of the day. It's a reflection of the person on the other end, right? And now I'm, I'm okay and comfortable in allowing you to see me. So that's what it is. Like, not necessarily who's Rhapsody, who's Marlena, you know? Was that challenging to unlock that part of yourself and and to allow yourself to be revealed and, and sort of vulnerable in that way? Yeah, even like being down to the final hours that I am now of this project, I have days where I wake up like, do you really want to put that song out? Like, you can still be vulnerable without telling all your business. And I always go back to like, my story is going to help somebody else be okay with it. And two, this is part of your growth to be okay. So, yeah, it's definitely hard to be naked in front of the world, especially a world that we live in where people don't even take the time to really sit with what you're saying and expressing and listen to you in a non judgmental way. Like, it's like everybody just, we got to have an opinion about it and say it. So, you know, it's, it's like, I don't know what's going to come with this, but at the same time, I don't care because I'm on to the next thing anyway, you know? So 
that's that's the part. But, you know, if you're not uncomfortable, are you really healing or growing? And so it's like, it's okay. You can sit and be uncomfortable. Like, you're not going to die from it. <laughs> so, yeah, it's challenging and it's scary. And, you know, it, it, uh, it shakes me up sometimes. But at the same time, I also get this thrill from it. Like, yo, I'm, I'm excited to just be okay. It's just, this is what it is. I'm not perfect, and neither are you. <laughs> so we that, in this we, uh, folk That's a shock together. to the internet. I'll yeah. tell you that, because they <laughs> think that they're perfect. Um, yeah. Yes. So you, along your path, you know, you've talked extensively about the level of discipline and the volume of just sheer hours that you've put into this mm -hmm. and, and sacrificed an enormous portion of your life to making all of this art. And, and you are now talking about sort of sacrificing a, a, a wall between you and the audience that is sort of your most intimate, private moments. Mm -hmm. is, the, is that thrill sort of do you get back what you put in to all of this when mm. the dust settles? I don't know. And that's another thing. I'm okay with saying I don't know these days. I think if I look at it from what you do get back is, you know, a type of freedom, you know, and success in a way that, you know, you did something that was uncomfortable. You allowed yourself to grow and be that's a, that's a plus for you. Um, but as far as, you know, like appreciation, going from always on people's most underrated list, and I don't know, you know, but I tell myself, you know, I'm okay with it. You know, at the end of the day, I'm just gonna do what I love and whatever comes, comes, we'll start from there. You know, that's the best answer I have, but yeah, I don't feel like I've gotten it thus far, but it's okay. <laughs> well, you know, obviously the, the, the To Pimp a Butterfly moment was an a enormous moment of inflection. Mm -hmm. Another huge moment was being nominated for the Grammy for Rap Album mm -hmm. of the Year. Yeah. Tell me, as, you know, an artist who is critically acclaimed and lauded for their art, but not necessarily, you know, sitting center stage. How does a moment like that, how is that transformative for your professional life? Mm. The moment of... Receiving that nomination oh. and sort of being put next to mm. Jay-Z, for example, in, you know, consideration amongst all of the other people who make recorded music in the world and having that distinction, mm -hmm. like, you know. Yeah, that was, a, that was a huge moment of acknowledgement, you know. Um, I don't put a lot of weight in, you know, the, the physical accolades, but at the same time, there's there's something in being acknowledged for all the sacrifices and the hard work that you made um and to be able to stand beside your peers and you know the legends that inspired you that lets you know like you do belong here there's a space for you there are people that see you regardless if you have again what people would define as you need a platinum plaque you need a number one radio hit. I had none of those things. All I had was a, a good album. Some people might say a classic album that inspired, influenced, you know, other people. So, you know, just to be acknowledging that, that way that, you know, we appreciate your art, you know, and we see you. That's like the, the wind that keeps, that's at your back, that's keep, like, keep going or just keep going, right? Um, yes, yeah, so it's, it's just a reminder. 
yeah. <laughs> but I, I think like it's bitter. That moment was bittersweet, right, for me personally. Um, Grammys is the height of music that you could be acknowledged as. So to be acknowledged on that stage, it's like, oh shit. But growing up, that was never on my list of things, right? You know, I was a young black girl, and I looked up. I really loved my blackness, so I looked up to the BETs and the, the Source Awards and the NAACP Awards, and it's like those were my Grammys, right? And at that time, before the Grammy nominations, and I'd never been nominated for any of those, so it was like, damn, right? Because the music I made, I appreciate everybody that listens to it, but I'm speaking specifically to, you know, someone that might be feeling like I feel that looks like me, right? But I, you know, I'm, I've met people, you know, that don't look nothing like me, and they, they tell me how their, my music affects them. I'm just like, damn, I never really realized that. And it's, it's such a fulfilling moment, right? And so, you know, at that moment, it was like, damn, we at the height of mu music, but am I connected with my people? Because that was so important to me. Like, I really want to connect with my people. Like, what's the disconnect that I'm having here? Especially with women. Like, I always thought women would be my biggest fan base, like black women, but they're not. It's black men are my biggest fan base, or men in general. And so I always go back with like, man, that was never like, Yo, what's wrong with you? That's always a self-reflection. Like, what am I doing? Like, why am I, what's the disconnect for me? So, you know, even that was a, a bittersweet moment. But I'm, I'm farther along and, you know, really getting there with that. How, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's interesting you mentioned that. I know, obviously, I'm sure you're familiar. No Name has gone on ad nauseum about similar uh, anxieties yeah. about the disconnect between the intention of the art that she makes and the audience that it receives. Um, and obviously, I'm not asking you about no name, but- No, let's go. I'm just saying, I ain't going that far. I appreciate all my <laughs> listeners. That's all I'm going to say. It is, I, I but, have like a beautiful moment in Boston. Um, this white guy came to me, he, he was like, thank you so much for your music. He was like, my girlfriend's black, you saw my Eve. And he was like, because of that album, I was able to understand and connect with her better. And I was like, I appreciate you, bro. Like, but yeah, like. No, but, but that is a real part of being, you know, a performing artist is, is part of it is about you getting out what you want to get out of yourself. But then also part of it is how it's being received and who is receiving it. Mm -hmm. And it is human to have goals on both sides of that equation. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And to struggle perhaps with where things are working or not working in, you know, sort of the alignment between the reality and the goals. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I can sort of understand that. And I was gonna say that also, I think, you know, when you see media personalities and people talking heads talking about you, there's always this sort of like, oh, Rhapsody's an album artist, which mm -hmm. is on the one hand, uh, kind of the highest praise that an artist can receive, but on the other hand is somewhat backhanded because mm -hmm. we live in a world, you know, I mean, part of music is jams. Yeah. And like having the, you know, Biggie's not Biggie if he doesn't make Juicy, right? Right. And mm -hmm. so I guess how do you sort of think about that part of your career and also your your art? And, mm -hmm. you know, where are, are you, do you resign yourself to, well, this is, this is where I'm most comfortable and I'm mm -hmm. succeeding and so this is, I'm going to double down on this or, or is there sort of attention in, in in you? Yeah, no, there's there's definitely attention. Um, even now, that's probably been my biggest focus, right? And I find myself like even treading careful in that way, right? I'm always going to be an album or legacy artist, you know what they say? Like, that's what I enjoy. Like, I want you to put my album in and just press play and let it let it rock, like. 
I grew up on classic albums. That means a lot to me. But at the same time, it's like you say, like, okay, that's where the constructive criticism comes in, where, you know, I have to step back and I can't take offense to it. But it's like, okay, that's what they're shining light on. So that's somewhere that I can, if I want to, that I can figure out, okay, what does a jam look like for me? And especially in this album, like, that's one thing I've been somewhat intentional about, but to a degree where I don't want to force it. I don't mm -hmm. want to fake it. I don't want, again, I don't want to copy what anybody else is doing. So it's like, what does that look like for me in this time and era? And it's just like, you know, I even had a producer. He was like, yo, my challenge, he was like, I want to be the first one to make a hit, a Rhapsody hit, right? And I'm just like, I appreciate that you understand that it has to be a Rhapsody hit and just not a paint by numbers hit, right? Again, Lauren's my biggest influence, and I think about when Doo Wop came out, right? That was a hit, and it didn't sound like anything else that I can recall that was out. It was just its own thing, but it resonated. So the challenge is, you know, what does that look like for me and trying to figure it out? And I don't know if I figured it out at all. And, you know, I have to tell myself, like, don't even, you can, you can be intentional, but at the same time, don't rack your brain too much about it, you know? Do the best you can, and it, it, you'll figure it out one day, you know? One of the things that I, I think about a lot as someone that sort of exists in a music-adjacent world and spent time at a major label mm -hmm. is there's this very weird duality of the streaming environment where labels and A&Rs put an insane premium on virality and these sort of like overnight sensations. Mm -hmm. However, the consumption model is actually, to me, like growing up, when we were kids, mm -hmm. you had to buy a CD. So they had to convince you to spend seventeen ninety nine at Tower Records or yes. wherever, Best Buy or whatever. And so it's, you're, you're trying to bait someone into a transaction. And I'm sure you had the experience that I had where you love one song and then you buy the album and then you're like, man, <laughs> this is a dud. Yes. But they've gotten seventeen ninety nine from me, so they won. Mm -hmm. We now live in a streaming environment where the proof is in the pudding and the long tail of a record is actually where the profitability is and part of why we now see all of these artists selling their catalogs and all this mm -hmm. stuff going on is because it's not, it's about will a 13 year old listen to this song 700 times in a row mm -hmm. not make this one transaction. So in, in some ways I, I look at the industry and I'm like they're chasing this weird like overnight model but actually the real value mm -hmm. is in the the artist who makes the album that the kid goes home and listens to over and over for yes. six months mm -hmm. and i don't know i i, I again I, I i don't know what that i don't even have a question really but I, i'm just <laughs> no that's a great point and that that's where the illusion and the fantasy comes in right like What's really real? You hear women lie, men lie, numbers don't. Yes, numbers do. Numbers lie all the time because men and women are behind the numbers at the end of the day. So you ask yourself, you know, what's the truth? And I think for me, like, wanting to have, like, it's like you say, like, I pride myself in having albums. Like, but I think the want for me into having, like, a jam or what I and you and I would consider a hit is when I perform, right? I want that feeling of like putting the mic out and everybody singing the words. Like, I wanna know how that feels, right? And to me, that's like, yo, how you get one of those, right? Um, not to say like, people don't know my, my music or the words, but it's, it's just a different. And I think that's just the one of mine, like I wanna experience how that feels, but that's, that's because I define a hit as that. I don't define a hit on TikTok. I'm not even on TikTok. And that's not to say like, you know, you can't find a way to use it as a tool, but that model, like you say, that the industry runs by now, is like, th that ain't my way of doing things. And that's one thing like I've been comfortable in learning is, yo, there's more than one way to get this, right? Um, 
And, you know, that's that's what it's figuring out for me. That's but that's that's a, a the great story point. of your whole career is Absolutely. <laughs> figuring, <laughs> figuring it out on yeah. your own terms. And that's the beauty of it. Like we call this idea generation. Like that's the meat of it. You know, OK, what's the idea to take what I do and to make it move how I'm going to make it? Like Vic Mensa just put out a, a the video where he jumped out the plane, Strawberry yeah. Louis Vuitton. And he had a caption. I hit him about it. And he was like, yo, man, the industry is taking the fun and creativity out of music. Like you got to have these $50,000 budgets. He was like, what happened to just figuring it out? And the artist is doing it. He was like, I, I shot, edited it, and did this video myself. And I was like, damn right. And that's one of the best videos he's, that I've seen him do. And it's just like, just going back, it's just going back to that for me. Like, we don't have to fit into your model. You know, we can, we can figure out our own thing from our own ideas and still make it go. That's the beauty of creativity and the individuality. Like, close your eyes and you open them in this infinite possibility so that's how I approach everything like yo how can I be creative what ideas do we have to make what I do connect with people you know how can we market different how can we advertise different why do, we don't have to use TikTok what's another model we can use where are the people that they're not sourcing why are we only focused on the United States when there's a world so much bigger than that I don't have to pop here South Africa, though, is love over there, you know, like, so just cha changing the way that we see things and success. I'm curious, you know, you, you are now 15 years into your career, maybe only seven years in the minds of, like, <laughs> yeah. most people, but 15 years in mm -hmm. the wear and tear on your mind Absolutely. and heart and <laughs> I'm feeling it knees too. and everything else. <laughs> Um, but I guess, how do you think about work-life balance given how consequential the level of grind was to your sort of elevation and, and ascension um, as, as you now have achieved a certain level of success and comfort and, you know, your, you you have your platform solidified. Mm -hmm. um, has has your have your feelings about that changed, and and how do you manage that? Yeah, definitely. Um, I don't regret you know the time and the sacrifices that I did make, but uh, one thing I've been able to step back and even learn from my artist Nico is it's okay to have some balance sometimes. So. You know, I'm these days I'm a lot more kind with myself and resting, taking a vacation, um, and pouring into myself uh, and trusting that you can afford to do that because you worked hard enough and you built enough solid foundation where you can give to yourself some too. Um, and I think that that balance is important, even in developing who you are as a person in your artistry. Like, I think balance is super important for your mind. Like, I sit back sometimes and I'm just like, I'm glad I, I worked as hard as I did, but I do wish I had taken a lot, a little bit more time to kind of enjoy life, you know? Um, but, you know, we're here now. Like, you know, even like I think about as a woman in family life, right? Uh, it's like, man, do you want kids? Did you want kids? Like, what does that look like? You know, what does that balance look like? And it, those, are, I don't really have the answers right now, but you know, it's just things I'm contemplating and I'm sitting with more, uh, but yeah. No, I mean, I watched again recently the, the Rapture episode with you and you mm -hmm. talk about essentially not even having space for a romantic life in your mm -hmm. yeah in your world in that moment and this was of course in the sort of lead up to Layla's wisdom you know and that struck me you know as that's a that's a heavy thing to mm -hmm. be resigned to um do you feel like there is more space now in your bandwidth for not, not 
I'm not trying to get into your personal life, but like it's cool. I'm vulnerable now. But for <laughs> life outside of mm -hmm. making it as a rapper. Yeah, I, I'm making space for that. Uh, indeed. Um, yeah, before it's just like a, that was one thing I wouldn't compromise on. You know, I wouldn't go out to the club. I wouldn't, wouldn't put even put myself in a position to make places because the music came first. Any free time that I did have, it had to be dedicated to the music because I felt like I had I had to sacrifice to even get that that far. Like I said in the documentary, it's a lot of sound bites. I had to work ten times harder, twenty times harder than everybody else. And now that we're here, you know, I find myself like. Okay, I'm I, I'm gonna go out tonight. I'm not gonna record tonight. Uh, yo, gonna take. I'm gonna go on that date tonight. You know, and I've had a uh, <laughs> a couple relationships <laughs> the last few years. But um, yeah, and I'm I feel like the music is better because of it. You know, um, I have so much life that I've lived lately because I've allowed myself to have that balance, to live it, to experience things, to experience love, to experience heartbreak, uh, you know, to, frustration, disappointment, joy, like all of it, sadness, grief, you know. Um, so, yeah, we, this, this, this season of life is a lot more balanced, you know. Um, this new album, was sort of born during the pandemic, mm -hmm. which was, you know, a, a global catastrophe, uh, the likes of which neither of us has ever seen in our lifetime. And I, I'm curious how that sort of period of isolation, both how you see it changing your, you and yourself and your art and also how you see it changing the audience that you speak to and like how, how you know, you, as an artist, you are very, you have to be in tune with the world mm -hmm. and with yourself. Mm -hmm. So I guess if just how, how do you perceive that as like that shift? Yeah, so when the pandemic started, you know, I was coming off Eve, two really good tours. I knew like the next album like I was putting out, it was 60% done. I was thinking of videos and roll out. And then, you know, everything stops and the volume turns down. The volume turns off, it turned off for me. And I would say that first year I spent a lot in solitude. I didn't want to watch CNN. Um, if I did anything that year, it was, you know, Black Lives Matter was at its height. And I did a lot of, of work with that and working alongside Until Freedom and with Until Freedom and Tamika Mallory and really getting boots on the ground and meeting people in that space. It's just part of my brand, like showing up in that space. So it was this place where when I wasn't doing that, I was at home at long, alone and I had just gotten out of, you know, one relationship and before that relationship another had ended so as far as my love life and that I was sitting and healing and grieving and uh, you know getting to know me again without needing to feel complete or happy through other people you know the famous Lauren uh, speech on unplugged is I had to reintroduce myself to me I had to get to know who I was again I had to evolve, I even had to change, but that went, I had to sit in the fire though and burn and feel things that I had suppressed a lot. And then you realize, you know, through like the grief of these relationships, you gotta peel back like, all right, what's really the issue, right? And I'm doing like a lot of coursework and how to manifest and it's got things on unblocking the child. And, you know, it's talking about a, a lot of our traits and characteristics were are built from age zero to seven. So you're going all the way back and like, you know, why do you do the things you do? Well, because this happened at five or this happened at, you know what I'm saying? So it's, it's a lot of self-reflection in that way. And at a time where, you know, I'm one that outwardly speaks about what's going on in the world, especially with Black Lives Matter, I'm going through this year and 2022 hits and it's just like I don't I have to turn off 
of all of that. I told myself, like, I don't see how Tamika Mallory and these people do this every day. This shit too is just too heavy. It's like I didn't I didn't I didn't want to tune into any of it anymore. It was too heavy along with everything else that was heavy that I was dealing with. So it was like I only have the energy to pour into me right now. And I felt like that was a majority of the world, you know, except for the ones that it was their duty at like Tamika and, you know, my my son and others that they like, no, we this is our space. But for me, like at a space where it's like I always put other people first, I always sacrifice myself. It's like, damn, this is my, t I have to give back to me right now. And that's what I did. So, you know, everything was about me and how I was feeling, what I was healing from, you know, how I looked at things, how I look at things now. Um, and that's what it was, it's just like, I really had to be inward and be with myself. And and that's what I, that's what I did, like. I still, even now, like, I still find myself, like, I still spend a, a lot of time in solitude now. But um, I think that's because, you know, I'm just still in it. And once the album is done and it's free, I can free myself and now I, I can come out. But right now, it's just like, I don't want to go to your parties. I don't want to go to this event. I don't want to do this panel. I don't want to do any of it. Nothing. And that's really hard for me to do because, like I say, like, you know, I think about uh, people that have poured into me. I just, you know, I'm just a giving person. And it's it, one of the things that I had to learn was just, it's okay to say no. It's all right. Like, you have a, another opportunity to show up for some, yeah, somebody else. But right now, you need you. So that's what the, the last 2020 to even now has been. How do you deal with, you know, we exist in, in, in a space where people are judged by their heat, right? Mm -hmm. And it, which is a very ephemeral and unquantifiable thing, <laughs> but it can also be a very anxiety inducing and, you know, I mean like whether it's social media, you, you put up a mm -hmm. post and you, you know how many likes it gets instantly yes. and you know you have these quantifiable metrics on how engaged and excited are people with me in this exact moment. And it fluctuates yes. radically based on, you know, Engagement. oh, Kendrick Lamar did this thing and now it's cool to like me. So now everybody wants to put me on their top 10 list or, but I'm still making the same art that I was making three days before Kendrick Lamar put me on <laughs> the thing. How do you navigate the emotional ups and downs of that? That's such a real question, because that's hard. It's so hard. And that's one thing during this process I find myself going back and forth on. It's just like I wake up and I'm just like, because I don't, I don't fall into the you know rigor rigor of I gotta post every day I gotta engage with you I'm just like so tuned off from that like I'm not playing that game and I don't want to but at the same time it's like but that's the world we live in so what's the detriment to your career and not doing this your engagement down your algorithms off like do and if you wake up and you're like damn do people even care right um and that's like Again, something I go back and forth on. Like, you spending all this time making this art, when it comes out, is it even going to matter? You know, and that's, that's, again, whether human or not, whether it's true or false, it's just the reality of how we feel as creatives and as people. Um, and shit, I don't, I don't know if I have the answer, but, you know, I'm still trying to even figure out how to balance that, where it's like, how do you honor yourself? in that way and how do you find a balance of like I understand the world we use in and that this is a tool and I, I have to do these things like I don't know if I've found the answer of how to balance it but these days I just wake up and I ask myself what feels good to you in this moment just do that and when it's time to do this other thing then we'll figure that out so that's how I approach things right now it's just like how do you want to honor yourself and, and feel good in the moment um, the things that have kept me going is, you know, I get on Twitter and, 
you know, for the last two years, my fans, are, they, they're serious, but it's a joke. Like, yo, when's the album coming out? Oh, my God, Rhapsody dropped the album. Just playing. I'm just preparing for when she does it. Like, those are the things that bring me joy. Like, okay, there are people out there that still care, right? But you, I have to learn how to exist even without that, you know? Um, and I don't, I don't know if I have the answer, but, you know, I, I just tell myself, like, yo, just trust. You got to trust yourself in this moment and, and trust the art that you put out and trust that, you know, there's more than one way. You just got to figure out what that is. But you, ha I have to honor myself in this moment. And if it doesn't feel good to my spirit and if I can't take it on right now and if I don't feel like posting every day, then that's what I'm not going to do. And when I'm ready to, then I'll come back and we'll figure out a game plan. But my whole thing is there's always, always a way. So, you know. I just, you know, I'm, I'm in this space of you always have what you need when you need it. It's never failed me. And so I just, I, I live on that, you know. And that has shown up in so many examples where, you know, I have a day and I'm just like, man, damn, like, how am I going to get through this day? And it's just like, I remind myself, don't stress. Be still. Let the, let the answer come to you, whatever. And the next day is, damn, I don't know how that happened or why it happened at that moment, but golly, every time I need it, it always finds a way to come through. And that's the peace that I've had. Like, as long as, you know, you exist in your authentic self and you do stuff with intention, whatever you need, again, it, it all starts with the seed of, of, your, of your, your thought, your imagination, and you always are in charge of creating your experience in your outer world. So I just, now I just wake up every day with that approach. Like, it's gonna be there. So thank you so much thank for you. giving me your afternoon and your thoughts and candor and all of this. It's really been illuminating. And, you know, I think I appreciate it personally and I'm sure that our audience will as well. Thank you. I appreciate it, too. I, I told my team, I was like, when this album comes out, I don't want to do a whole lot of interviews. I want to be very specific. And I'm glad I got to share this with you. Like, this is one I'm like, I want to talk to Noah. Thank and you. I want to give him this part of me. So thank you for giving me a space to be, just to be, you know. But we got to have part two when the album comes out. Yes, I would love that. <laughs>